Welcome, my name is Jill, and here we talk about this idea of all things or a new way to look at road culture. Not the same as RV community. I'm all about creating a new kind of culture uh, for those of us who like to live and work and be on little tiny wheels. So what I wanted to talk about today is something that there's not an absoluteness to it. So please uh, take this as personal experience and something to reflect on. Uh, and that really is this idea of private property zoning and where can you park? Because I think that's such a huge issue right now. Uh, you know, the RV community really focuses on BLM land, on boondocking, things like that. You know, the easiest thing to do is to go into a RV or travel trailer park. Uh, there are usually costs associated with that. The nicer the climate, the more the costs. <laughs> At least that was my experience. Uh, but the problem, which I don't know if you guys know this or not, is that a lot of those uh, traditional RV parking communities won't allow people like me who like to go vintage or old school or alternative we are in a horse trailer uh, they won't allow you a lot of times it has to be 10 years or newer for your rv to be okay to park in their uh, vicinity so what do you do if you don't want to boondock and you don't have the money or you don't want to go long term into an rv parking situation or you don't want to travel extensively in terms of camping uh, one of the big things that people do do is they park on private property and I'm in New Mexico and one of the reasons I came to New Mexico was because once upon a time New Mexico was pretty loose in its restrictions you know I had the idea someday I wanted to build some kind of home uh, and be part of a little community on some land so I could homestead well that didn't work out turns out I like living in the trailer mobile version and homesteading was just you can't do it by yourself it's a lot of work so uh, I gave up that version but I still like this idea of being able to be in rural land and on private property but that's kind of a tricky situation in today's culture and so that's why I want to spend just a few minutes talking about what I've learned and experienced because that's actually very different than the zoning rules you're going to find if you look up specifically what's allowed in your state so let's roll it back and talk about it but first we're going to take a deep breath see freedom that dirt everywhere All right, so you want to park on your private property or somebody else's private property. And uh, so is that legal? Well, in a lot of places, it's legal temporarily. So you're allowed to park a trailer or RV as a home for a specific amount of time. In our town, it's considered six months. At that point, after the six months, you're required to uh, be able to take the wheels off and establish it more as a permanent residence, uh, including hooking up to some kind of uh, utility slash waste disposal system depending on how things operate in your community now does everybody follow that absolutely not so uh, before we talk about that we need to, to remind ourselves right that there's the city zoning rules there's the county zoning rules there's state rules and then there's federal rules and obviously this is for the, uh, the United States of America uh, I don't know how things work in other countries and none of my trailers are going to be going there. So, uh, so there's different rules for different locations and that's really important because you can have conflicting rules a little bit and this is the piece that I most want people to hear. Just because something's a rule, a law, or a code what counts is how it's enforced within that community or that area and how it's enforced is most often comes down to politics, uh, community values and the individual person who is writing the tickets. And I say that because when I first came to Mountain Air, they had uh, what I thought was a nice guy until we got into it on some uh, issues around this 
is that he, you know, was making eight bucks an hour and it was like a power trip. And he was running around town writing up code violations on everyone and everything. He was looking for the littlest tiny violations. Well, the structure at that time, they didn't like that. So they got rid of him. The code went lax. And now there's a new regime. They came out with, I think, six pages of new code violations and traffic violations that all have, you know, 75 and higher price tags associated to them that if you break those rules, those codes, those laws, and you get caught, you have to pay a fine. The same is true at the county level. Most uh, properties, rural properties, whether it's yours or somebody else's, almost everybody has some form of RV or trailer parked on that property. So in terms of viewing it, people driving by, there's usually no assumption that somebody's living in that situation unless they go by every day and they start to see things that cue them or uh, clue them into the fact that somebody's living on that property. And so the county is the same as the city. It depends on who's enforcing the codes, how vigilant they are, how much time they spend in your area, but most importantly, how much money they're trying or revenue they're trying to generate. What I've experienced is the two biggest issues are revenue generation in terms of enforcement of codes and laws and things like that, and personality issues about wanting to enforce codes and things like that. So uh, at the county level, like I said, almost everybody's property has some kind of RV or trailer or one of the things I like about the horse trailer, there's no red flag about seeing a horse trailer parked in a rural community. So there's not an initial red flag, but that's when your personality can create as many problems as the person who likes to write the tickets. And that really becomes uh, two things. So part of parking on private property and zoning restrictions is the personality of the people enforcing it. The second half of that is your personality and how you interact with the community and whether people want to tattle on you. Uh, one of the problems or concerns I have right now is that somebody next door has a lot of junk on their property. He has a personality that's a little grating. He moved into town uh, in the last year. He moved onto his property and he's getting into it with the county. And so uh, that bodes poorly for me because I'm right next door to him. So if they catch sight of somebody living out here, you know, that could create a problem. Most counties and cities do not want people living off-grid and uh, in an RV, a trailer, or a tiny home, or a, a, any kind of, of, of a structure unless it's been inspected, permitted, permitted, and regulated, and it's hooked up into the system so that they're getting utilities from you. That's the other huge issue that I've seen. Even uh, when you're off-grid and you're generating your own energy, they still want you hooked up because they can charge you first to install it. And even if you're in a situation where you're generating more energy and it's flowing back into the system as a credit, there's still a lot of costs for uh, coming out, setting the system up, maintaining things like that. So as more and more uh, cities, council, uh, cities, towns, uh, counties, states, things like that, the more money they seem to need, the more tightly they try to enforce everything around your living in that situation. And so I'm bringing that up because uh, one of the things I think most of us do is we look at the rules and then we try to make our decisions based around the rules. And one of the things I've learned by living in one place for a long time is that the rules are not as important as who you are. Are you causing problems, making people want to pay attention to you and report you? Or are you the person enforcing the rules and you want to be very vigilant in your enforcement? And that has a lot to do with the individual code person writing the ticket and the policy of the existing structure, which changes, you know, with the election. So it's always in a fluid state. And I think that's the most important thing. So just because you buy a piece of land or you agree to park on a piece of land, I hope I'm not jinxing myself by making this video, <laughs> that it's not a done deal and you don't know what kind of restrictions are going to be coming down the road. So one of the reasons I like this idea of being mobile is that if the restrictions do become an issue, you can just pick up and leave. When you 
become a firm and planted and anchored uh, structure on a piece of land, it makes it much more difficult in terms of compliance and uh, any kind of fines or problems or lawsuits or things like that that go along with it. Now, can everybody live like this? Absolutely not. Some people have to commit to the process of being permanent, and I think it's for people like us that need to support them in that process of creating a permanent location in terms of being respectful, not causing problems, things like that. So uh, that's just a little bit of a window. Uh, it's not a perfect answer because the most important piece is that there is no final decree. No matter what the law says, it doesn't mean that it won't cause problems for you at some point. And you need to factor that in when you're making decisions about where you want to go and whether you're going to be welcome coming down the road the next time. So uh, that's a little bit of our uh, talk today. So we're going to take a deep breath. But before we go, I'm going to say I hope you'll subscribe. Check out the links below. As you see, I have diversified into multiple uh, YouTube channels and websites. And then we'll see you next time. <laughs>